So, but but the point is, I just want you to understand, Abdullah grew up um, in that type of household where they they dressed in a certain way, they they ate a certain way, they talk, they spoke a certain way, they walked a certain way. So when he comes to Medina, he's not like the other Abadila, you know, where they they're, they're humble, they've been around the Prophet and so on and so forth. He's different. Okay, he's clearly different. And he wants to change things quickly. So you'll find many narrations. One of them, Abdullah ibn Amr al-As says that once the Prophet ﷺ, he saw me dressed in two uh, saffron colored garments. Okay? Uh, now, uh, the, these garments that he was wearing were obviously not acceptable, not permi permissible. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, has your family commanded you to wear these? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, you want me to, to to change them, to wash them out, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, it's better that you burn them. هَذَا لِبَاسُ kuffar. Those are the clothes of the disbelievers. It's not befitting for a Muslim to wear those clothes. Now, Abdullah ibn Amr is not Ibn Abbas anhu. His description, طَوِيل أَحْمَرْ عظيم الْبَطْنِ From Qatad rahimahullah ta'ala. He was tall, he was, he, you know, he had, a, he, he was, uh, he had a, the reddish complexion, so he's very light. And he had a really, really big stomach. I mean, they grew up eating a lot. Okay, Azim al Batan. All right. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi He also walked by Abdullah ibn Amr once while they were putting up a wall. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told them that you could put more effort into it. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam noticed that that sense of royalty that just naturally carried over um, into Islam. Now here is the thing: Abdullah ibn Amr changes, and he changes very, very, very fast. It doesn't take him long to change. He changes extremely quickly, too extreme. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. In essence, the, in essence, if you could summarize the biography of Abdullah ibn Amr, it's slow down. <laughs> All of the interactions between him and the Prophet ﷺ are slow down. He's trying to take too much on at once because he's coming. He's not like the others. You know, he's coming and he's trying to change everything all at once. Now, some of that is virtuous because. He memorized the entire Qur'an in his first year of being Muslim. Okay, which is not easy to do. He memorized the entire Qur'an within his first year. And he immediately developed, you know, he immediately identified the ulama, the scholars amongst the companions. And he attached himself to them and he attached himself to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, So particularly, uh, he developed a love for Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he even used to say, and this is in Al-Bukhari, um, لا أزال أحبه I, I will never stop loving this man, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول خذ القرآن من أربع because I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say take the Quran from four uh, من عبد الله بن مسعود from Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله عنه وسالم ومعاذ وأبي. Okay, these were the four people: Ibn Mas'ud, Salim, Muadh, and Ubay. So he said, I will always love this man. And so he used to attach himself to Ibn Mas'ud عنه, and he learned the Qur'an uh, from him. What makes him unique in Islamic history and what makes him so special is his love for hadith as well. His love for the ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, the sayings of the Prophet So he says, حَفِظْتُ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, الفي مثل, That I, I memorized on the part of the Prophet وسلم, over 1,000 ahadith. And he even used to write it down. He used to write down everything the Prophet ﷺ would say and he would memorize everything the Prophet ﷺ would say. Now, here's the thing. Early on in Islam, in the very early stages, the Prophet ﷺ did not want them to write down his sayings. Why didn't he want them to write down their sayings in the very early years of Islam? What do you guys think? So it wouldn't get mixed up with the Qur'an. While the Qur'an was still being written and compiled and in the formative stages, the Prophet ﷺ did not want them to start writing his sayings and then mixing it with the Qur'an. After that fear was gone, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged it. So a lot of people use those old narrations, Qur'ani, and people that deny hadith, and they'll say that the Prophet ﷺ didn't want people to write down hadith. Right? But actually, this narration from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As anhu, he said that I was writing down everything the Prophet ﷺ said. And he said, some of Quraysh, they, they, they stopped me. Some of the Quraysh, they told me, you know, are you writing down everything you hear from him when he's, when he's a human being? Right? And he speaks sometimes in ridha and in ghadab. Sometimes he's, he's in pleasure and sometimes he's angry just like a human being. Are you writing down everything that he's saying? So he said, I stopped writing. And I told the Prophet ﷺ what happened. So Rasulullah he pointed with his finger to his mouth and he said, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By him in whose hands is my soul, 
مَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ إِلَّا الْحَقْ اُكْتُبْ Nothing comes out of this, of this tongue, of this mouth, except for the truth. Uktub, write. And he said, I said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فِي الرِّضَى وَفِي الْغَضَبِ When you're pleased and when you are angry, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, even when I'm pleased and when I'm angry, you write everything that I say. So he had a direct order from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to write everything that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, now when it comes to hadith, Abu Huraira is synonymous with hadith. You always associate Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu with hadith. Abu Huraira, he says that there is no one, مَا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَحَدٌ أَكْثَرَ حَدِيثًا عَنْهُ مِنِّي That there is no one from the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم who knows more hadith than me, who has narrated more hadith than me. He says, إِلَّا مَا كَانَ مِنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ إِبْنِ عَمْرِ He said, except for that which has come from Abdullah ibn Amr, فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَكْتُبْ وَلَا أَكْتُبْ Because he used to write and I did not write. So Abu Huraira says, هُوَ أَعْلَمُ مِنِّي He's more knowledgeable than me when it comes to hadith. So that's, that's as great of a testimony as it gets in hadith. Okay, when Abu Huraira says, actually he's the only person that's probably more knowledgeable than me when it comes to hadith. And Abi Qubayl, he says that, he narrates that Ibn Amr said, "Kunna عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم نَكْتُبُ مَا يَقُولُ We were with the Prophet ﷺ writing what he said. What does this tell you right away? It wasn't just him. Alright? So hadith collection, in the last stages of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, people were actively writing down the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. But he was the ultimate document, the, the ultimate, uh, you know, his sahifa, his book was the ultimate documentation of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And it actually came to be known as as-sahifa as-sadiqa. As-sahifa as-sadiqa. Okay? Which means the truthful tablets. He compiled in that tablet almost a thousand ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Written hearing it directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And basically he took the Sahifa everywhere with him. And uh, Abu Qubayd, he says that he used to have it in a locked box. <laughs> I mean, it was the most precious thing. And he said he would carry that with him along with his water jug. When he had to travel somewhere, he had his water jug and he had his Sahifa. He was never letting it go. The Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in fact, people asked him once, SubhanAllah, this is very beautiful. They said, which city will be conquered first? Uh, Constantinople or Rome? Okay, so what's modern day Istanbul? Which one is going to be conquered first? So he asked for the box, he brought the box, he unlocked it and he took the box and he read, we were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we asked Rasulullah that same question, which is going to come first to the Muslims? Constantinople or Rome? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said the city of Heraclius, which is Constantinople. And SubhanAllah, that's exactly what happened. And that's an authentic hadith in Musnad Al-Imam Ahmad. Now, uh, it, it also, SubhanAllah, Abdullah ibn Amr is the one who named it as Sahif al sadiqah He also didn't, you know, he was also very careful with it. And he didn't want people, you know, messing around with it because he was so afraid of it being lost or so afraid of someone doing something to it. So Mujahid, Mujahid is also a student of Abdullah ibn Amr. He's the primary student of Abdullah ibn Abbas, but he's also a student of, um, of, of Abdullah ibn Amr. He says that, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, I used to walk into his house and I used to be in his house and I could go through all of his papers and all of his books. He said, so one day I put my hand on a Sahifa Sadiqa. And he said, he said to me, stop, like he, he, Abdullah ibn Amr actually panicked, subhanAllah, like don't touch that. And Mujahid, he said, why? He said, تَمْنَعُنِي شَيْئًا مِنْ كُتُبِكَ are you, are you stopping me from reading one of your books? Like this isn't normal, you never stop me from reading anything uh, from your books. So Abdullah, he responded, he says, إِنَّ هَذِهِ الصَّحِيفَةُ الصَّادِقَةُ That this is a Sahifa الصَّادِقَةُ التي سمعتها من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس بيني وبينه أحد and I used to hear these narrations from the Prophet وسلم, directly and there was no one between me and him there was absolutely no one between me and him so he 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 said that you know I, I just can't he actually he actually continues and he says فإذا سلم لي he said if I have with me كتاب الله the book of Allah وهذه الصحيفة and this book والوحط Al-Wahd is a garden, Wahd, Wa-ha-ta. Wahd is a garden that was in a ta'if. 
and it belonged to his father Amr ibn As and he donated it to charity, but he would maintain it and he would give of it for sadaqah. Basically the entire garden would be managed and, be, and, and it would be a place, a source of food and so on and so forth for the poor. So Abdullah, he used to take care of Al-Wahb after Amr ibn As, he used to take care of this huge garden, he would give of it sadaqah. So he said, look, he says, if I have these three things in my life, Lam ubali ma dayatu min dunya I don't care what I lose from this world. These are the only three things that are important to me in this life. Okay? Quran, the Sahifa, and Al Wahd. Alright, this this garden of mine. Uh, and that's a hadith, it's an authentic hadith in a darami. Now uh, he reports, so so we said it's over seven hundred hadith. Someone could easily say, what happened to the Sahifa? If you know, if this really was a hadith collection effort that was going on, what happened to it? It's very simple. Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah. He took the entire Sahifa and he included it in his Musnad. So his Musnad of Hadith has the entire Sahifa of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As. So the Sahifa was not lost. Actually you'll find the Musnad of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As inside the Musnad of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala. So it was preserved there. And you also find some of the Ahadith of, of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As um, in Al-Bukhari. Uh, so you find 8 of them in Bukhari, you find 20 of them in Sahih Muslim. Uh, you find you find just a few scattered here and there. Now, why is it that if you know he's not as commonly narrated from as Abu Huraira? All right, he memorizes more hadith than Abu Huraira. He writes more hadith than Abu Huraira. He Abu Huraira radiAllahu anhu did not used to write. All right, he had incredible memory, and that's another story when we do the, the biography of Abu Huraira one day, inshallah. But why is it that he's not like Abu Huraira or like Ibn Abbas or like Aisha? Okay, may Allah be pleased with them all. Why is he not on that level in hadith narration? Number one, the important factor here is that what we'll find from the life of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As is that he goes out in jihad, he's out in battle next to his father Amr al-As for the rest of his life. So anywhere you find Amr al-As going in history, Abdullah is commanding a significant part of his army. So he's not sitting in a place and teaching like the other Sahaba were. That's number one. Number two, where he eventually settled was in Misr, was in Egypt. And Egypt was still developing in regards to Islamic sciences when he was there. So it wasn't like uh, Medina, all right, where the other hadith narrators were settling and hadith was primarily coming out from Al-Medina. That's where the effort of hadith collection was coming from, primarily was Medina. So it wasn't like Al-Medina where you had the Sahaba, where you had many of them, you know, really t making it a point upon themselves uh, to constantly um, Report, okay. So this is this is very significant. It's important to understand. But he would again. He had the Sahifa. People would come to him. They would ask to see something of it, and he would do so. And Subhanallah, you find um, Abu Rashid, uh, radiAllahu anhu. He said, "I came to Abdullah ibn Amr, and I said to I said to him, can you can you give me a du'a from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you have in your Sahifa?" So he said he pulled out his Sahifa, and he pulled out a page. And it was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu asking the Prophet sallallahu um, for a du'a to say in the morning and the evening min athkar al-sabah wal masa. So the Prophet sallallahu taught him Allahumma fatir al-samawati wal-ard alim al-ghaybi wal-shahada la ilaha illa ant rabba kulli shay'in wa malika a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi wa min sharri shaytani wa shirki wa an aqtarifa ala nafsi su'an aw ajurrahu ila muslim uh, if you if you read the morning and evening remembrances from Fortress of the Muslim, you'll find that du'a. So I don't even try to write it down, but it's it is a du'a um, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught Abu Bakr radiAllahu Anhu directly again coming from a Sahifa to Sadiqa from that Sahifa of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As radiAllahu Taala Anhu. You also see that he narrates the Hadith. There is the very famous Hadith that whoever lies on my behalf. Okay, متعمدًا. He lies on my behalf intentionally. فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Then let him choose his place in hellfire. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever forges a hadith, whoever forges something I say, مَنْ قَالَ عَلَيَّ مَا لَمْ أَقُولْ Whoever says that I said something that I did not say, then let him choose his place in hellfire. So he's actually the narrator of that hadith. Okay? Um, one more thing which is very, very interesting about him, in regards to his ilm, we're not, we haven't gotten into his personal life yet, all right? but in regards to his knowledge, um, is he had knowledge of the scriptures that came before. Knowledge of the Isra'iliyat, okay? of the scriptures of Bani Israel. And he actually says in an authentic hadith, 
in Abi Dawood, he says that the Prophet wasallam used to relate to us the traditions from Bani Israel until the morning came. So that means that he spent nights with the Prophet wasallam, where the Prophet wasallam specifically narrated to him some of Akhbar Bani Israel, some of the stories of the Prophets of Bani Israel and some of the, the traditions of Bani Israel. And he said nothing would stop the Prophet wasallam except for the Fard Salah except for the mandatory prayer. So he spent a significant amount of time with the Prophet Sallallahu in that regard as well. He is the one that narrates the hadith, Hadithu an Bani Israel, wala haraj, that share the traditions of Bani Israel, and there's no harm in doing so. However, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, you know, not to believe them, uh, you know, completely. لا تصدقوهم ولا تكذبوهم You don't believe them altogether, nor do you deny them altogether, because you might deny something that's true, and you might believe something that's false. So you can use them, obviously the stories of Bani Israel, um, you know, in order to, 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 to benefit in some way historically and things of that sort. But obviously when there's something that contradicts the religion, then you reject it. And when there's something that doesn't contradict the religion, then you don't completely affirm it. All right, you're not sure of it, you don't completely affirm it. So he's the one that narrates that. And Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he says that Abdullah ibn Abbas, he had two, uh, two of the scriptures of Bani Israel that he kept with him as well. Two of the scriptures of Bani Israel, so two portions of the Torah that he kept with him as well. Now some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what about the famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu? Umar, we know this, it's a very famous hadith that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was reading, um, you know, something from the Torah and the Prophet sallallahu became angry with him. And the Prophet وسلم, he told Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala anhu that if Musa alayhi salam was here, then he would have no choice but to follow me. Okay, so how do we reconcile this with that? That there is a Sahabi here who's well versed in the scriptures before, and there's Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala anhu that's being admonished for reading from the scriptures before. Number one, what we what we have to understand is that hadith is not authentic in and of itself. It's, there is no, that story, this narration where Umar was reading from biblical scripture and Rasulullah came to him and chastised him for doing so, there is no one authentic hadith, at best it's Hassan li ghayrihi. Okay, it can be considered an acceptable hadith because of uh, the multiple ways that it was narrated. Though it's not authentic in and of itself, but there are many, you know, it seems that something of this sort took place between the Prophet ﷺ and Umar al-Khattab anhu. We're not sure what the exact wording was and so on and so forth, but clearly the Prophet ﷺ was, was upset with Umar ta'ala anhu over reading from the previous scriptures. Uh, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala, he writes about that though. He, and he says that there are several ways we can understand that. Number one, we could, we could say that it's possible that this was in the early stages of Islam, where again, Islam was not yet, you know, was not yet established. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ was admonishing him for that. Or he was reading it out of curiosity, right? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ so w- w- was doing so. Or he was reading it without ilm, without the ability to discern between right and wrong. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was admonishing him. In any case, we still find this from, from uh, Abdullah ibn Amr, that he becomes a scholar of sorts in the previous scriptures um, as well. And in fact, um, Ata ibn Yasar radiallahu anhu, Ata says, and this, is, this hadith is actually in Al-Bukhari, um, he asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he said, did you find any description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Torah? Did you find any description of the Prophet sallallahu in the Torah? So Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, wallahi innahu la mawsufun fi tawrati uh, he, he's given some of the descriptions in the Torah that are just like Sifatihi fil Qur'an, just like his, his explanation, the description of the Prophet Sallallahu in the Qur'an. Okay? Uh, so when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la says, yeah, then he recites, Ya ayyuhal nabi, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. He says that he found something similar to this in the Torah. Then Abdullah ibn Amr al-As narrates this entire uh, this entire portion, this huge portion, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari, a description of the Prophet Sallallahu that he found in the Torah. وَحِرْزًا لِلْأَمِّيِّينَ أَنْتَ عَبْدِي وَرَسُولِي سَمَّيْتُكَ الْمُتَوَكِّلِ لَيْسَ بِفَضٍ وَلَا غَلِيظٍ Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la says in the Qur'an, لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ 
Okay? So it says, uh, he said that I found in it that it said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'll just read, it's such a long one, so I'll just read the English one. Those of you who want the Arabic, I'll give you the Arabic one, inshallah ta'ala as well. That, O oh Prophet, we have sent you as a witness for Allah's religion and a giver of glad tidings and a warner and a guardian of um, al ummiyin the, the illiterates. You are my slave and you are my messenger. I have named you al mutawakkil al mutawakkil is the one who depends upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not harsh, nor are you discourteous. لو كنت فضلاً غليظ القلب so فضلاً غليظاً You're not فض nor are you غليظ So it's, a, it's the same one The Prophet ﷺ is not severe nor is he harsh hearted um, Nor are you one who makes loud noises in the marketplace Nor do you respond to evil uh, with, f- To those who do evil to you But instead you deal with them With, uh, with المغفرة والعفو With forgiveness and with kindness Allah will not let you die until you make the crooked people straight by bringing them to La ilaha Allah, by making them say that none has the right to be worshipped by Allah. With that, blind eyes will be opened, deaf ears will hear, and enveloped hearts will open. Okay, so this is a long description that Abdullah ibn Amr says, I heard of the Prophet ﷺ, or I read of the Prophet ﷺ in the Torah. So he clearly has um, knowledge of this as well. There's a munkar hadith, there's a fabricated narration about Abdullah ibn Amr that floats around a lot in, in some of the biographies about him, which is that the Prophet ﷺ supposedly told him um, to, to spend one night in Qiyam with the Torah and one night in Qiyam with the Qur'an. Obviously that's not uh, authentic, it's not, it's not appropriate, nor would the Prophet ﷺ ever do so, and there's no sanad to it whatsoever, there's no uh, chain to it whatsoever um, in any case. Uh, we, we find that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to refer some of her students to Abdullah ibn Amr al So he's someone that, that developed a sense of ilm, a sense of scholarship that was recognized by again Abu Huraira, by Aisha, by many of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in fact, subhanAllah, you find that there's a beautiful narration, a beautiful conversation, narration of a conversation that takes place between him and Abdullah ibn Abbas. All right, now think about this. All right, who are the two people that are sitting? Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. Abdullah ibn Amr, he asks Abdullah ibn Abbas what his favorite ayah in the Qur'an is. <laughs> SubhanAllah, what a beautiful conversation, right? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, well, what do you mean by favorite? He said, the one that gives you the most hope. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said to Abdullah ibn Amr, he said, well, what's yours? So Abdullah ibn Amr, he responded and he said the ayah from Surah Al-Zumar, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. If you ask most Muslims who know the Qur'an what verse uh, gives you hope, they would say that verse, right? So it's a very unique, it's not a very unique answer, it's a very, it's almost a generic answer. All of us would probably say the same thing, you know, if you're asked what ayah really gives you hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to despair from His mercy, well the one that says don't despair from the mercy of Allah. So Abdullah ibn Amr, he said to Ibn Abbas, he said, what's yours? And subhanAllah, you see the, 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 the mind of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says when Ibrahim alayhi salam says, رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتْ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَ قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَلَى وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَ إِنَّ قَلْبِي When Ibrahim alayhi salam said to his Lord in Surah Al-Baqarah, O oh my Lord who gives life and who gives death, show me how you give life to the dead. And Allah Azza wa Jal responded to Ibrahim alayhi salam and said, what? Aren't you going to believe? أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ Don't you believe? قَالَ بَلَى وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَ إِنَّ قَلْبِي he said, yes, but this is just to put my heart at ease. And Allah Azza wa honored the request of Ibrahim Islam, didn't he? So Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu said, if Ibrahim had the right to ask, we have the right to ask as well. So Ibn Abbas in essence, it shows you that Ibn Abbas had that depth where Ibn Abbas liked to find the hikmah, the wisdom behind rulings and the wisdom behind ayat and the depth because he says, well, Ibrahim alayhi salam made that request of Allah and Allah honored his request. So we are a haqqu, so we have a, a greater right. If Ibrahim Islam has that right, then as, as regular Muslims, we have a greater right to, to ask that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that again, it shows you the personality of Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu was one 
that used to always find the deeper meanings of everything. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As on the other hand, when you study his life, he's someone that feared hellfire a lot. He's someone that found himself frequently uh, afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so, so that's, that's very important to understand here. He's very afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has a sense of overzealousness. And so to calm himself down, to put himself to ease, he remembers what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you not to despair of his mercy. And this shows you different personalities, subhanAllah. Even these scholars, they had different personalities, different things brought them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, different things appealed to them of the Qur'an. There's nothing wrong with saying that one part of the Qur'an gets you more than other parts. Some people, ayat of, of paradise, ayat of jannah, really, really, really get them. Some people, ayat of hellfire, really, really, really get them. Right? Everyone has their own different appeal. That's the beauty of the Qur'an is that as you're reading to it, each ayah has its own sweetness to it and it pulls you in accordance with your personality type. So it goes to his overzealousness. He had a serious, serious, serious overzealousness. He wanted to change everything right away with his personality. So there's a very, very famous hadith. This hadith, you and subhanAllah, by the way, in the next few hadith we'll cover, there are hadith that you probably already heard. I'm sure you've heard it in a khutbah, but this will give you perspective on those hadith. You remember the hadith of the three men that came to the house of the Prophet ﷺ? Right? Asking what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. He was one of them. Okay, so the hadith is narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. That three men came to the house, they came to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and they asked the they asked the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, what was the ibadah of the Prophet ﷺ like? What is what does the Prophet ﷺ do when he's home? And they're expecting what? They're expecting that Rasulullah does Qiyamul Layl all night long. That the Prophet he never he walks into his house and his wives come to him and try to hug him and he says, No, astaghfirullah, read Quran now, I don't have time. They're expecting to find that the Prophet life inside of his house is all ibadah, is all worship. So when they ask the wives of the Prophet what the Prophet does in his house, and the Prophet he eats with them, he's talks to them, he asks them about their day, and Rasulullah he's intimate as with, with, his, with his spouses as well, the Prophet he sleeps for part of the night as well, they just weren't very happy with it. Not that they felt any less of the Prophet they kind of looked at each other like, that's all? Just one third of the night? <laughs> Imagine what they'd say about us, right? Just one third of the night? Wow! And so they looked at each other, and they said, وَأَيْنَ نَحْنُ مِنَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. But who are we to the Prophet قَدْ غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَرَ Allah has forgiven him for all of his previous sins and all of his future sins. As for us, where are we? Okay, we, we're not even close to that. So they looked at each other and they, and, and they all kind of made a pledge to each other. So one of them said, أَمَّا أَنَا he said, as for me, I'm going to pray every single night, all night. Every night, all night, Qiyamul Layl. No sleeping, no breaks. Another one responded and says, Amma ana asumu dahr. He says, as for me, I'm going to fast every single day. Every day of fasting. And then the third one says, Amma ana a'tazilu nisa fala atazawwaju abada. As for me, I'm never, you know, I'm going to never touch a woman and I will never get married in my life. So these three men say that this is what we have to do because he's the Prophet of Allah Wasallam. he's forgiven, we've got to do more than that. Now notice something very beautiful in hadith narration, okay, you have to understand this, that whenever it's something that's not positive, the names of the Sahaba are not mentioned. <laughs> okay, so we know who these three men are, but just generally speaking, you know, they don't mention the names of the Sahaba when it's something that's, that can be negative. Okay, so this is obviously a negative situation, but for historical context here to understand the development of Abdullah ibn Abbas of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, I just want you guys to understand that he's one of them. The Prophet ﷺ, he, uh, he, when he was told about that, the Prophet ﷺ, he asked for those three men and he called them and he said, Antumul ladhi qultum kada wa kada, are you the ones that said that you would do this and do that? And they said, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ says, أَمَّا وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَخْشَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَتْقَاكُمْ لَهِ He said, I swear by Allah that I am, the Prophet is speaking about himself, I fear Allah more than any of you. I have more awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than any of you and I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than any of you. وَلَكِنِّي أَصُومُ وَأَفْطِرُ I fast and I break my fast. وَأُصَلِّي وَأَرْقُدْ You know, I, I pray but I also sleep. 
He says, وَأَتَزَوَّجُ nisa, And I get married as well, and I'm intimate with my wives. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي So whoever turns away from my sunnah is not from me. The Prophet ﷺ does not want these three people to burn themselves out and he says, this is not my sunnah. The, 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 the notion of asceticism, of zuhd in our ummah is not this. It's not just abandon the world and don't do anything. No, it's, it's to do things in moderation. The sunnah is moderation. So these three men, they were Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As was the one that said he would pray all night without sleeping. The second one, is Al-Miqdad ibn Amr. Okay, Al-Miqdad. And Al-Miqdad, you know, notice these are famous companions. Al-Miqdad radiallahu anhu is a very famous companion. He's the one that said, I'm going to fast every single day and I'm never going to break my fast. And the one that said that he would never get married was Uthman ibn Mad'oon. Uthman ibn Mad'oon, also a very, very beloved companion to the Prophet Wasallam. But these were three young men and they got over, they got really excited. They got together and said, we've got to take it to the next level. What can we do more? What can we do more? This was their, pers- this was their personality. They wanted to go above and beyond. Now, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he, again, his whole biography is slow down. Because subhanAllah, he just feels like he has to catch up. And, he, and, he, and he's so afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he just wants to keep on doing more and more and more and more. So listen to this narration, all right? And this is widely narrated in, in many of the books of Sahih. Amr ibn As, he got Abdullah married. So Abdullah ibn Amr As was not married. He got him married to a very beautiful woman from a very noble tribe of Quraysh. All right. So this woman is someone that expects to be treated well. Again, you know, Abdullah's not coming from a family that's that's a joke. He's coming from a, a royal family, and they get him a beautiful, religious as well. She's a righteous woman. She's a Muslim woman. And she's from a great tribe, she's from Quraysh, so she has everything. That's a hasabin wa jamal. Right? She has the status, she has the beauty, she has everything. Alright? So he you know, Abdullah gets married to her. Now, what is the sunnah of the Prophet? ﷺ? What did he teach us on, on the wedding night? What is it that the husband and the wife do first? Pray two rakas, right? They're supposed to pray two rakas. Now there is no mention about what you're supposed to read in those two rakas. Okay? But some people will make it really, really, really fast. Right? Some people might just read Al-Fatiha and say that's all that's fuddled anyway. Right? Some people will do the Qul Allah had Allah someone I mean, you know, <laughs> it's your wedding night. Right? Now if you really if you're really feeling religious, you want to read Surah an Naba or something like that, go a little bit uh, further into Juz Amma, let's start our marriage on the right foot. Okay, fine. You start getting into the 29th juz, all right, this is getting ridiculous now. What if I told you that a man read Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran? (laughs) But it's actually worse than that. He read the entire Qur'an in those two rakahs. And Fajr came and he was finishing the Qur'an (laughs) and he didn't touch his wife on their wedding night. All right, so Abdullah ibn Amr took it to a whole nother level here. He did a khitma of Qur'an on his wedding night in the two rak'ahs with his wife. So that's like, okay, that was never done before. You know, we don't see that <laughs> happening from any of the other sahaba, nor is that, nor is that something that's, that's praiseworthy. Okay? So this is, this is how he sets the tone of his marriage. And he really is someone who prays all night long, fasts all the time. Right? I mean, he's, he's so indulged in his ibadah, in his worship, that he has no time for his wife. So his wife was clearly like getting frustrated, neglected. So Amr ibn As, he'd ask, he'd ask his daughter-in-law, he'd say, you know, how is Abdullah? And she would say, huwa khayru abid. He's a great worshiper. <laughs> she, wouldn't, she wouldn't say bad things about him. But she was indicating, she'd just say, Huwa khayru abid, like he's a great worshipper. All right? She didn't go in on him and like say he's terrible and those types of things. She just kept saying, Huwa khayru abid. He's a great worshipper. Now it's obvious that was her complaint. He, all he does is worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu one time, when he asked her, you know, well, does he touch you? You know, does he, are you guys okay? Is he, because he, she just keeps saying, Huwa khayru abid. So she said, you know, he has no need for this dunya. 
He never, he's never touched the bed. Not only has he never touched me, he's never touched the bed. I mean, all he does is he fasts and he prays and he reads Qur'an. I mean, he has no need for this world whatsoever. Now, subhanAllah, think of the transformation in this man. You know, he comes from, again, a royal tribe, indulges, luxurious, has a certain lifestyle, you know, a, a family of pride and arrogance. And now look what he's subjecting himself to, right, right away. So this is not normal. So Amr ibn As goes to the Prophet ﷺ to complain about Abdullah. Goes to the Prophet ﷺ and say, look, Abdullah is not going anywhere near his wife. All he does is read Qur'an, pray and fast. He does nothing. Like, you know, how amazing would that be if that was the complaint that you would have of your child? Right? This is not coming to the Imam or coming to the Shaykh and saying, you know, uh, he plays too much or he's, you know, he's, too, he, he's watching too much sports or he's playing too much, you know, Xbox or whatever it is. This is, my son reads too much Qur'an. And my son prays too much Qiyamul Layl. And my son fasts every single day. Like that's his complaint about his son. So the Prophet ﷺ, he calls Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he says, Ya Abdullah. He says, Oh Abdullah. Alam ukhbar. He said, Am I being told, Annaka tasumu nahar wa taqumu layl wa taqtimu al-Qur'an? I'm being told that you fast every day, you pray all night, and you finish the Qur'an every single night. He does a khitmah of Qur'an. It wasn't just his wedding night. It wasn't like he didn't want to touch his wife. So he did. No, he was like, that's my habit. I'm going to do it tonight too. You know, I'm going to do my khitmah tonight as well. So he says, Bala ya Rasulullah. He says, yes, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ says, Fala taf'al. Don't do that. Sum wa aftir. Wa qum wa nam. Fast and break your fast at times. Stand up and pray, but also sleep. فَإِنَّ لِجَسَدِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Your body has a right upon you. وَإِنَّ لِعَيْنِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Your eyes have a right upon you. وَإِنَّ لِزَوْجِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Your wife has a right upon you. وَإِنَّ لِزَوْرِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ Okay, وَإِنَّ uh, What's the translation of زَوْرِكَ? I have to find the translation of that. But وَإِنَّ بِحَسْبِكَ أَن تَصُومَ كُلَّ شَهْرٍ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ it's enough for you to just fast three days of the month, okay? And he says to he says to him um, that if you fast, فَإِنَّ لَكَ بِكُلِّ حَسَنَةً عَشْرَ أَمْثَالِهَا If you have with every one of your good deeds ten times its reward, so he's telling him to fast the ayam al bil the three days of the, the three middle days of the month, the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth. He says فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ سِيَامُ الدَّهْرِ كُلُّ He says if you do that, it's as if you fasted your entire lifetime. Just fast those three days of the month. You'll cover every month, you'll cover your entire lifetime. So Abdullah ibn Amr, he said, listen to how he responds to the Prophet He says, دعني يا رسول الله أستمتع من قوتي Let me, O Messenger of Allah, derive pleasure from my strength. Let me use the strength, like derive the pleasure that I, that I can from the strength that I have. Like I can do more, ya Rasulullah. Let me Da'ni astamti'. SubhanAllah, he's saying, leave me to my pleasure. Let me find the joy of my strength in fasting more. The Prophet ﷺ said, then you can fast two days a week. You can fast Mondays and Thursdays. He says, Ya Rasulullah, uh, you know, he says in the narration, فَشَدَتُ فَشُدِّدَ he, I kept on pushing the Prophet ﷺ and he kept on pushing me back until the Prophet ﷺ, um, when, I, when I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, inni ajidu quwa, I've got the strength. I can do more. I can do more. The Prophet ﷺ says, فَقَالَ فَصِيَامَ نَبِيَ اللَّهِ دَاوُدْ نَبِيَ اللَّهَ دَاوُدْ So you can fast the fast of Dawood وَلَا تَزِدْ عَلَيْهِ And do not increase, do not go any, 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 any more beyond that. And I asked him, what is the Siyam of Dawood? What is the fasting of Dawood? Rasulullah ﷺ said he would fast one day and he would break his fast the next day. So that is the ultimate Siyam. The best siyam is the siyam of Dawood If a person wants to maintain that as a habit in their life, then do so. They fast one day, they break the next, the next day. They break their fast the next day. He said, and, and as for your qiyamul layl, the Prophet ﷺ says that the best qiyam is the qiyam of Dawood He used to sleep the first, the first half of the night. He'd wake up for the last third. He'd pray, and then he'd sleep for the last sixth. Okay, meaning Dawood would sleep through the first half of the night, he'd get up in the last third, okay, he'd pray the last third of the night, but right before Fajr, he'd take a nap, and that was the sunnah of the Prophet He says, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more, inni la ajidu The Prophet said, no, that's it. 
He said, and ask for your qiraat al-Qur'an. He said that you can finish it. How much do you finish it? How, how many times do you finish it? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I finish it once a day. The Prophet ﷺ said, once a week. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. You know, I can do more than once a week. So the, he said, I kept pushing the Prophet ﷺ till he said to me, um, you can do it once every three days. Once every three days. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that anyone who does it more than once within three days will not properly understand it. So once every three days. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more? No, that's it. Like the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, you're only allowed to read 10 juz of Qur'an a day. <laughs> that's like restriction on you. You can only do 10 juz a day. More than that is not acceptable. So Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, he, says, he, he said, I kept on pushing the Prophet ﷺ. That's what the Prophet ﷺ um, he, he gave to me, and that was it. And so Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, he, he had to be restricted, he had to be restrained. Now here's something I just wanna, that, that I want to point out. Did the Prophet ﷺ allow some people to fast every day? Yes, he did. There were actually companions that fasted every day. The most famous of them, Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Talha used to fast every day except for the two Eids. Did the Prophet ﷺ allow some people to read Qur'an more than once within three days? Yes. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he used to do not just one khitm of the Qur'an, he'd do two a day. Okay, this is actually authentically narrated that Uthman radiallahu anhu used to do two a day. Some of the companions used to do a khitm of the Qur'an once a day, once every two days. In Ramadan in particular, they do one, two a day. Some of them would do two, two a night as well. Two during the, one during the day, one during the night. I mean, this is something that the Prophet ﷺ allowed for some people. Did the Prophet ﷺ allow some people to give all of their wealth in sadaq? Yes, he did. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiAllahu ta'ala anhu. But Rasulullah ﷺ, he knew the level of his companions. He knew that there were, there, there were exceptions to these rules. There were some people that could read the Qur'an with khushu' more than once every three days, but it wasn't the norm. There were some people that could fast every day and that could keep that up. But that wasn't the norm. There are some people that can give all of their money in charity. And they want, they want just, you know, comp- they, they want they want demolish themselves or, or destroy themselves and their families. They want, they'll, they'll be okay. They won't fall into poverty and depression. They'll be all right. But that's not the norm. So, for example, when Ka'b ibn Malik comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, I'm giving all of my money in sadaqah, the Prophet ﷺ says, no, I'm sick alayk ba'd al Keep some of your money with you. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, but I, I want to, no, <laughs> keep some of your money with you. So he, he just decided to just keep a little bit of money uh, with him. But for the most part, I mean, he gave it all away. Abu Talha came to the Prophet ﷺ when he heard the ayah, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرُّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ That you will not achieve al-birr, which is righteousness and the reward of righteousness, being Jannah, until you spend from that which you love. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said that I'm giving all of this garden, giving this huge garden away for the sake of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, I think you should give it to your family. Prophet ﷺ, he knew. Right? He knew where his companions were, that, were at. When Abu Bakr comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Ya Rasulullah, on multiple occasions, says, Ya Rasulullah, here is all of my money. The Prophet ﷺ knows what Abu Bakr is going to do. Abu Bakr anhu is going to go back to the marketplace, he's going to earn his money again, he's going to take care of his family, and then sometime later he's going to come and give everything away in sadaqah again. But he'll be fine. He has the spiritual maturity to handle that burden. Abdullah ibn Amr has only been Muslim for a couple of years. And he's a young man, and he's excited, and he's got this overzealousness. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he comes to him, and he says to him, Ya Abdullah, and, and Abdullah ibn Amr, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he used to frequently give me this advice. He saw me burning out, or he saw the fear of burnout in me. And he used to come to me, and he used to say, Ya Abdullah, O oh Abdullah, لا تكن مثل فلان, do not be like so and so. كان يقوم الليل فترك قيام الليل. Don't be like so and so, who used to pray a lot at night, he used to pray qiyam al-layl, then he stopped it altogether. Meaning what? If you try to set this standard for yourself and you try to pray this much, then there's going to come a day that you're not going to be able to pray at all. So don't set that standard for yourself. Calm down from now so that you don't depress yourself later on in life. So he's trying to teach him a sense of moderation, but it shows you again the personality of Abdullah ibn Amr that he could come into Islam and in just a few years collect more ahadith than any of the other companions. 
and he had that, that dedication where he wanted to take everything on at one time. Um, inshallah ta'ala, after the uh, break, we'll go into now the, the maturity, the growth of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As in terms of learning moderation and some of the instances with the Prophet sallallahu and so on and so forth. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll go ahead and we'll take a break now. Jazakum uh, khairan. We will break for Salatul Isha. <laughs> 